Um, so I'm going to share my screen pretty briefly um, so that we can have all the panelists introduce themselves um, and then we will start. Um, so first I'll call on Toby to introduce himself and also to tell us, um, and this is a question for all panelists, what is the most recent thing that made you laugh out loud? Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, hi everybody, I'm Toby Hodges. Uh, I am the curriculum community developer at the Carpentries, which means I work with members of the Carpentries community uh, to help them make, develop new lesson material. Um, I'm also that embarrassing 35 year old guy that still listens to punk rock. And um, the thing that made me laugh out loud most recently was I think yesterday when my son dribbled up my nose. Mm. Thank you, Toby. It's, it's great to have you. Um, Abby. I think I was next. Hi, I'm Abby. Uh, coming off Mays, Jason, you did a valiant try. I know my name is hard, um, but I lead Mozilla's uh, developer engagement strategy around trustworthy AI and MozFest. Um, and before this, I founded and led Mozilla Open Leaders. Um, the last thing that made me laugh was right before we started recording, just hearing about all the big bucks that Jason makes <laughs> as a food stylist. The answer is zero. Uh, <laughs> but I thought that was really funny. Excited yeah. to be here. Thanks. <laughs> Great to have you, Abby. Um, Steph. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> and since Sarah said we had one and a half minutes, I'm going to say like five extra words. Um, I'm Stephanie Butland. I'm the community manager for R Open Sci. R Open Sci fosters um, a culture that values open and reproducible research. And we have over 400 uh, packages that are contributed by both staff and community members. Um, and these packages are meant to uh, help people do their science. Um, we're particularly well known for our system for open and collegial software peer review um, and also having a welcoming community that works with each other with kindness. Um, my personal superpower is helping people recognize themselves and the value that they can bring to a project. Um, and for anyone who's attending who's wondering, uh, community management really is a legitimate emerging career. And so I started as an academic scientist, came through project management because I always thought the collaborations um, were way more interesting in the process than the actual papers that came out of it. And so four years ago, I found my calling as a community manager. Um, I'm proud to have a GitHub sticker on my dirt bike and a mm -hmm. Kawasaki sticker on my laptop. And um, my family counseled me not to say this, but the last 10 things that made me laugh out loud all had to do with the planet Uranus. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's completely okay, Steph. It's, it's great to have you on the call. Um, and for everyone joining us and everyone in this session, we'd also love to hear what made you laugh most recently, laugh out loud. So if you want, you can share in chat as well. Um, next, we have Angela Lee. Hi hey everyone. Um, my hair is a little shorter than it is in that photo. So I got my first haircut in, in a while recently. Um, but I am the previous maintainer community lead for the Carpentries, which I'm excited about because that means there's space for someone else to come in and develop that community and, and help it grow, which is going to be great. Um, so I guess I put some generic words on here because I'm not quite sure where I'm going at this point, but um, I'm starting and growing computational communities. So I have some work um, in that respect, both for um, in an academic setting and then sort of outside of more traditional academic settings. Um, and I also love building capacity. So if you have uh, questions about sort of starting, growing, and then giving away communities, like that's something that I feel like I have um, maybe a little bit too much. Maybe, maybe it's a good thing that um, I give away my projects instead of holding on to them too, too tightly. Um, and I also feel really strongly about inclusive teaching and pedagogy. Um, I think the Carpentries has been a huge um, factor in this, obviously, and then also working with um, people from really diverse backgrounds and thinking about inclusion in that way. Um, I'm trying to think about the most recent thing that made me laugh. 
Um, recently in my home, there's been a bit of an ant fiasco, which mm. doesn't sound like the thing that would make you laugh, but um, I think it's really nice to have like a partner who just like finds it as funny that we were like, we're talking about, like we probably shouldn't leave out our food and then like the ant fiasco like came like the next day. So um, I think just finding the joy in, in sort of unfortunate situations can sometimes be um, a good way to, to you know, have a laugh, even though like there are a bunch of ants everywhere, so. I completely agree. Um, there's great value in finding joy in everything. Um, thank you, Angela and Kate. Folks, I am the bioinformatics training manager at Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington. Um, I, in general, you know, come from a background in higher ed, on a long history with the Carpentries. I was involved in community governance, and my career focus right now is trying to do my best job um, developing both community and training and talking about how those are actually sometimes the same thing in uh, the biomedical research community. Um, when I am not doing dorky things related to science and education, um, I do a lot of fiber arts and that uh, means that my apartment right now smells a lot like wet wool. Um, Jason might be smoking sausages right now, but okay. I am dying things, which means you know getting it wet and heating it up. The last thing that made me laugh out loud uh, I have a habit of sticking googly eyes on things in my apartment right now. Um, and so I'm submitting a picture to my work group of a plant with googly eyes because I don't have any pets and we were suggested to send in pictures of pets. So I'm saying it's my new pet. Amazing. Thanks for sharing, Kate. And I'm next. So my name is Sarah Rono. I am Director of Community Development and Engagement at the Carpentries. Um, I like to say that my everyday verb at work is listen. Um, so my work involves a lot of listening, brainstorming, and working with our communities to figure out different strategies that make sense um, for the context they're in, the needs that they have, um, the domains that they work in. Um, and I enjoy building and um, finding ways to sustain and grow existing communities. And I also really enjoy the great outdoors. Um, the thing that made me laugh out loud most recently um, was um, something I came by when I was looking up library humor, which I really enjoy. Um, so this library had set up a table for books on procrastination and then they had a notice that <laughs> they were going to get around to it at some point so the table was empty so that, that made me very happy for no reason at all. Okay um, and I see that chat has been busy. Thank you all for sharing the things that bring you joy and that have made you laugh out loud. Um, so we are going to start in the interest of time. Um, so I'm going to be asking questions to our panelists and um, at some point we'll have a discussion. Um, I put out a question in um, the etherpad and it's in line 51 and it's a question for all of us, a question about climate crisis and the responsibility of communities um, in this regard, um, especially with regard to traveling to conferences and things like that. Um, so have a look at that question. We will have a round table discussion at some point. Um, for now, I would like to start um, from the very beginning. Um, so we've mentioned community a lot um, in our introductions. And for our purpose, um, for the purpose of this conversation, I want to define community very broadly as um, a group of people who come together to work towards a shared goal. Um, and so a question for you, Kate, um, I want you to speak on the development of community values um, as a cornerstone for supporting communities and the individuals that join these communities. 
Thanks. I am especially excited about community values right now. I was a member of the Carpentries Executive Council when the Carpentries values were being developed. And in the two years since I've been at my current position, I have been working pretty hard to think about um, what are the interesting and different things about the community here and about the way that I'm supporting the community compared to things being very siloed and very hierarchical um, in other areas. And of course, I found that the values completely underlie that. Um, my group just had a blog post come out that had a draft of our community values that highlight things like open science, um, the idea that we care more about um, learning than about knowing things, um, and really being able to put voice to some of those main characteristics that I think a lot of us in the Carpentries community take for granted, but are not a given in most other communities. And that relates to professional development pretty closely because for all of the objectives that I have as a community builder, I try to also make it do double duty for some other purpose. So I'm trying to facilitate the community while at the same time offering an opportunity to a trainee who's interested in developing a particular skill like teaching or like leading a group. Um, even if I develop outreach materials for use with high school or undergrad students, Honestly, the difference between a high school student starting to do biomedical computational research and someone with a PhD who's never done computational research, it's not that big, right? And so thinking about ways that we can continue to branch out and integrate the different activities in a way that helps facilitate everyone and helps normalize all of the community values that we have is one of the reasons that I'm really passionate about it. And, you know, in the coming months, um, my team member and I are gonna be spending a lot of time uh, doing some more writing and more thinking about how we can make it explicit that community values like the ones in the Carpentries community and like the ones that we've developed for our workplace um, really help support individuals mm -hmm. while they're also supporting communities. Amazing, thank you, Kate. Um, and so you, you touched on professional development. So I want to talk more about that and this will be a question for Angela Lee. Um, so you have a community that is working towards shared goals, uh, that has shared goals and has these values um, to support them as they go along. Um, so a question we got from a community member is how does a community member in a community um, graduate to being a community leader? Sure. Um, I want to sort of jump off what Kate said and, and sort of reemphasize why community values are so important, which is because you attract people who are as into those values as you are, right? So um, I joined the Carpentries because I saw that it was a group of people really dedicated towards inclusion, towards thinking about all these things. And, and for a while, I was just a community member. So I was just, you know, getting started with teaching, learning how to do things, like getting really invested in, in sort of um, the sort of on the grounds, like doing some of these workshops. Um, and that was really exciting for me um, just to, you know, see those values play out and, and mm -hmm. see them go on. Um, I think I started becoming more of a community leader when um, I think, you know, there was like a, a, little, a need that I saw. Um, so one of the, the lessons had not been super maintained for a while and I really wanted to change something. So I sort of um, jumped in and I was like, hey, like I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm willing to help out with this. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's sort of one thing led to another and somehow then I ended up like leading the maintainer community after um, having, uh, you know, just gotten started with it because I was passionate about it. Um, but, but I think like that process of going from, you know, just being a community member to being a community leader gave me a lot of perspective on um, what are the challenges faced by community members and how might I support that as a community builder? So obviously like this is not the case with all community management roles. You can't, you know, go up, like it's not that like you start at the very bottom of the organization or not the bottom, but like, you know, on the ground level and then you sort of move up. Um, but for me, it's been helpful to sort of chart and sort of plan out the future. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that was definitely something. But I also think it had a lot to do with people encouraging encouraging mm -hmm. me and being welcoming throughout the whole process. So mm -hmm. um, that was a huge factor and why I stuck around because I knew there are people who, um, I worked with Aaron Becker, who's on this call really closely for a really long period of time. And I just felt like I got so much mentorship from her and mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I, like, I wouldn't trade that for anything. So like having people who are willing to do that is like so, so important. Um, 
I like talked a little bit more about sort of this path in like a blog post I wrote about the maintainer community lead position, which I'll, I'll drop in the chat. Um, Amazing. And feel free to take a look at that. But it sort of talks about how I developed as a person, how I like um, sort of went from being overwhelmed by just teaching to being mm -hmm. part of the community. Awesome. Thank you, Angela. And yay, Erin. <laughs> um, and so, Steph, I have a question for you. Um, so this community member has, you know, gained experience and um, become a leader in the community um, in different aspects. Um, are there resources that exist for people who sort of find themselves in this position um, as community leaders, community organizers, um, and who often feel that they are making things up as they go along. Um, yeah, <laughs> are there resources? So, yes, there are definitely resources. And I guess the first thing I want to say mm -hmm. is it, it really is hard work. Um, I heard some people uh, talking about this in a previous carpentry session I had attended, where, you know, it's easy to start a community and get things rolling, but sustainability mm -hmm. is a whole other thing and you don't get to experience that till later. So I want to acknowledge and to have everybody realize that yeah, yes, the stuff you're trying to do is actually really hard and it requires working with intention and set a goal, just like any other kind of project management. Um, but I know one of the issues that may come up is, you know, undervaluing you know, the soft skills, those interpersonal skills relative mm -hmm. to the the technical skill stuff. Um, so I have a general resource and then a, what I consider a very personal resource to suggest. So the general resource is something that a handful of people here um, are familiar with already. It's mm -hmm. called the Center for Scientific Collaboration and Community Engagement. Um, so it's CSCCE. This is a community of practice of community managers in science. Um, and the best part about it is it's people who work for all kinds of different organizations, um, but who really get each other and kind of understand the kind of issues that we're all dealing with. Um, one of the best ways to get exposed to this group is by attending a community call, let's say. So you can just, you can listen, you can meet some of the people and you get to see just like this kind of thing. You get to see how people, well, they smile when they interact with each other. Um, mm -hmm but there's a Slack group that people are welcome to join um, and you can ask questions, you know, I'm dealing with this thing, not sure how to handle it. And a whole bunch of people will answer, give you their suggestions um, or you can share, there's a channel for like shared joy. I'm so proud of this thing I did. You could share it there. Um, this is, you know, outside of our open side, it's my favorite place to be and actively participate in. Um, my, specific recommend or my personal recommendation, uh, I refer to this as find your Naomi Penfold mm -hmm. and your Steffi Lazert. So Steffi Lazert is uh, my uh, colleague and a co-author um, on a, our OpenSci community contributing guide that we just released yesterday. Um, and Naomi is someone I met through the CSCCE. She works for eLife and um, these are people that you know they get me we can talk about the issues we can act as peers nobody worries about stepping on someone else's toes something that naomi and i do almost weekly and we've published a blog post about how we do it there are lots of different ways to do this but mm -hmm. remote co-working so for naomi and i what this involves is we have a weekly regularly scheduled two-hour meeting we meet mm -hmm. on zoom we spend the first few minutes saying like How's life this week? How are you feeling? What's the big picture thing you're going to work on for the next two hours? Um, and, and then what's the thing you're going to work on and try to accomplish in the next 30 minutes? Mm -hmm. And then we have a web-based timer. We start the timer. We turn off our video. We turn off our sound, but we mm -hmm. stay in the Zoom meeting. And then we work away doing our thing. Timer goes off. We both come into the Zoom and was like, how was that for you? Yeah. And sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, I finished this and now I'm going to move on to this. Or another time, other times, what often happens, and this is where that collegiality, and especially if it's a person outside of your organization, you get a really different reflection on the stuff you're working on. Mm -hmm. um, there was one specific time working on a project um, and I had a lot, of, a lot of stuff and complexity that I wanted to convey to staff so that they could give me specific feedback, but there was so much to pass on. How do I do this? And mm -hmm. I just expressed 
what I was challenged with and Naomi kind of reflected back to me like, hey, what about this? Um, so we both get, you know, mood boosts sometimes when one of us is down, like we're at different parts of the roller coaster, help each other out. Um, but also we get work done. You get mm. your own work done, but with a colleague. And we were doing this before everyone became physically isolated from each other. Mm. Um, but it's works perfectly now as well. So that's my suggestion. Amazing. Thank you so much, Steph, for um, highlighting um, the import importance and value of other people as a resource um, as you work as a community organizer and, you know, um, with communities. That's really great. Um, and Toby for sharing the link um, to Stephanie's and Naomi's um, blog post. Thank you. Um, so Abby, I have a question for you. So we started talking about resources um, available to community members as, as they work to build community. I'm wondering, um, and this is a question that also came in. Um, so you find yourself leading a community initiative in some way um, and you do not have a code of conduct. Um, so how can someone set out to quickly um, put together a code of conduct and especially in situations where budget is limited or non-existent? Yeah, um, I love this question because I do think whenever possible you should reuse a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of great ones out there, Contributor Covenant, Citizen Code of Conduct, even Mozilla's uh, Community Participation Guidelines. Those are all ready for you to use and adopt in your own work. Um, we wouldn't write our own licenses, our open licenses. I think there's similar reasons why you shouldn't write your own code of conduct if it makes sense. There are cases where you'll wanna write your own or adopt it or adapt it. Um, but I think in many cases, you can just use one of the existing ones that are out there. Amazing. Um, and so if people have examples of great code of conduct that people can look at, draw inspiration from, reuse, um, please drop them in the chat. Um, that would be really great. Thank you, Abby. That's very helpful. And then Toby, a question for you. So there's a community, they have shared goals, um, they have values and a code of conduct in place, um, but that doesn't quite translate to kindness as we've had other people mention kindness um, and the importance of kindness in communities. Um, so how do people go about cultivating humaneness, as someone put it, um, in communities? Um, I guess, speaking from personal experience, what I've found to be helpful in this regard is modeling the behavior that you want to see, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked in, unfortunately, environments that may sound familiar to others on the call as well, um, where like being positive and enthusiastic about things is somehow deemed to be like deeply uncool um and being jaded and cynical is the kind of uh standard way mm. to to behave in that in that environment and i find that extremely depressing um i guess it can be really intimidating though when you're when you are working in that kind of environment to um to try to go against that and to actually show some enthusiasm. Um, but what I've found, I guess, is that if you do that anyway, <laughs> then some people, at least in the group, will take your lead, I guess, and, mm -hmm. and also start responding in kind. Um, it doesn't necessarily work for everybody, but you don't, even need it to work for everybody really you only need it to work for like one or two other people for you to feel like it's worth persevering mm -hmm. with um and i am not saying that that is a um that that is a like method that will work on its own and solve all the problems of course i'm not that would be far too simplistic but um i recognize that sometimes it can be difficult to be kind of brave and put yourself mm -hmm. out there and do that yourself but I promise like you'll be rewarded for it mm -hmm. um the other thing I want to say is like going beyond that kind of positivity and enthusiasm specifically if you're like unapologetic about being kind to other people and v verbally kind of support people when they display kindness 
mm-hmm. to others um, um, then again I think that's what you can do as a leader to try to at least encourage that kind of behavior that you want to see in the environment that you're in amazing I, I love that um, I have a follow-up question for you Toby um, so um, like Stephanie said this definitely is hard work um, and as you also uh, recognize it takes perseverance it takes time um, and this is likely to take a toll on you because you're a, you're a human being, you're a person, right? Um, and so my question for you is, um, so how do successful community managers balance their life um, with the work that seems to take everything that everyone has? How do you avoid the trap of, all, of there always being more than one could do at any given point in time? Yeah, well, this is a struggle that every, well, that I've had, at least, I don't want to speak for everybody else. Um, Some advice that was given to me recently by another um, carpentries instructor was Mm -hmm. to deliberately practice, like in front of the mirror or something, saying, Mm -hmm. no, but thank you for the opportunity, Mm -hmm. or saying, uh, even if you can't actually bring yourself to say no, say uh thanks for thinking of me uh that sounds really interesting i just need to check my calendar before i commit to anything because i might have forgotten about something else i've already agreed to do or whatever Mm -hmm. and that gives you the time and the space to go away and actually check your calendar for a start which is something i really have needed to get into the habit of doing but also i don't know for me i find it helpful to get that bit of extra time to compose the nicely worded polite email that actually says no uh, that i'm much more comfortable doing than saying no to people face to face i think um when you take time off and you should take time off take time off I'm, I'm kind of an advocate of the total media blackout approach to holidays where if, if it's possible for you to do that, I know that some people have positions or responsibilities that mean that they can't disconnect themselves completely. Um, I'll also echo what Steph said, uh, like advocating for the CSCCE community of practice of community managers Um, a problem shared is a problem halved to use a cliche. I've been, you know, a lot of people aren't lucky enough to even be a community manager as their real actual job. Um, mm-hmm. And they're expected to do it while also doing some other more well-established um, full-time job. Uh, and that's kind of unfair. I've been very lucky that I've worked in positions that are specifically for community management. And I've been even more lucky that I haven't been the only community manager for my community. In the previous mm-hmm. position that I held, I was working with Um, Well, a lot of cool people, but specifically for for the longest time, uh, Malvika Sharan, who I know quite a lot of you will know from, seems like she's involved in every community, so Mm -hmm. probably everyone on the call knows her. Um, And that was amazing, of course. And now that I've joined the Carpentries, I get to work with Sarah. So I'm, you can count me as the luckiest person on the call, Mm -hmm. I guess. But if you don't, if you're not lucky enough to have that, um, or perhaps even if you are, connect up, find ways to connect up with other people, like the co-working sessions that Steph mentioned, for example. Um, and if I can say one more thing about this, yeah, get some right. rest. Make sure you do get enough rest mm-hmm. um, day to day, as well as making sure you take extended time off. And beyond that, help the other people around you to stop feeling constantly like they're not doing enough, like you probably do. Um, I certainly do by talking about all the stuff that you do that isn't work normalize having conversations about that stuff so Mm -hmm. that people realize that you do do other things other than work all the time um when i realized that that was the case it helped with my imposter syndrome a lot and i actually only know a handful of people who genuinely do work all the time thank you toby um that's very insightful and helpful Um, So Angela Lee, I have a question for you and it's very related to what Toby was talking about. Um, It came from a community member and they ask, what practices or skills have you found most transformative in working with others as a community leader? Ooh, this is good. I feel like I have a a few that that I've developed over time. Um, I think one of the first ones for me is is practicing gratitude on a Mm -hmm. daily basis. I I think a lot of people here do that and it it just like helps me through the day and and helps me sort of realize 
like how amazing my communities are. Um, so it, by that, you know, reaching out to people and letting them know, hey, like that was a, a fantastic like talk you gave, or I really appreciated when you like helped out with that one thing. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't do it enough, and, and I wish I did it more. But I think every time I do, like even just ping someone and say, hey, like really appreciated that, like it makes my day better, it makes their day better. Um, so I think that's like a fundamental practice. I'm trying to get good at, good at it. Um, mm -hmm. So sort of that, that praise, like, like, like making sure that you're telling people what they're doing well, not only like, you know, we could improve this, we can improve this. Um, mm -hmm. And this is something that I feel like it took me a while to, to develop because I'm always so focused on like, what can we do better? Like after, you know, a successful event or a launch or something, um, after some resource goes out, I'm like, well, oh man, we could have done this better, we could have done this better. Mm -hmm. But stepping back and doing a debrief of like, what went well? Like, what, did, what was good about that? What do we want to keep? in that process, like focusing on, like doing a debrief of your success, not mm -hmm. only like how to improve, right? So making sure that's a key part and like, um, so I think that's sort of two things, like gratitude and then debriefing your successes. Um, and once I started doing that, like I realized, you know, um, sometimes um, my successes aren't actually, like their successes in like the outcome, but they're maybe not successes in the process, right? Mm -hmm. So like, like whatever came out of it might have been good and then um, maybe the process to get there could be improved. So thinking about that too. Um, trying to think of something else. I think one other final thing that I want to mention is, I think listening is is probably like, um, I used to feel really nervous about mm -hmm. open silences and like, I would always rush to fill those silences. And especially on Zoom, it just gets really awkward after a while. Like you don't want to, you don't want to just sit there in silence, but um giving myself and like doing a little count like to five seconds in my brain. And then, you know, people who are quiet, like will jump in and say something. Um, and, and I think like really working on those listening skills. So um, I think if you can take like a coaching class, like if you can take a class that allows you to like develop those listening skills, like that's so valuable. Um, the first thing I did as a maintainer community lead actually was have like three or four months of just random calls with like people in the community and just like talk to them about you know what's going well like what are what's going on what's happening maybe this is the social scientist in me you know just like sitting with people and being like hey like so like tell me about your experience in the community like what's happening and sometimes you don't have the time for that but if you do um it's definitely worth like the input yeah, it's sort of like the ethnographic, like, tell me about your experience and like, mm. tell me about what you need. Um, and from that, like, I realized that there were things that I didn't even realize that we needed to like, think about that were really important to people. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess the listening, the practicing gratitude, the debriefing your successes, those are a few things that really were transformative for me. Thank you. That's very helpful, Angela. Um, so the last two questions we've been talking about self-care and the strategies that we employ or that we suggest that others consider employing in their everyday lives um, and i'd also love to hear from you um, in the chat um, what what kinds of self-care activities do you engage in every day just to you know um, make sure that it's not all about work for you um, as toby said be really great if we can share as well. Um, and so a question that I want to throw um, at Abby, um, we've been talking about self-care a lot um, and we are in communities. So at what point does self-care transform into community care and how do we do that? What does community care entail? Yeah, I think they're very much related. And sorry if I look distracted, if someone dumped something on our yard Anyways, I'm looking outside, I'm a little distracted. <laughs> um, but I do think community care and personal care are both really related. And the way I see like personal care um, is just making sure I'm running at a pace that I can sustain long-term. Mm -hmm. And just knowing that I can't sustain a movement or the community um, if I'm not sustaining myself. So starting with that and making sure I'm pacing myself properly and like everyone's pace is different and it changes depending on what life stage you're in. Um, but then p adapting that to the community, like helping your community pace themselves. You don't want your community to be a flash in the pan that gets mm -hmm. really worked up and does something for one week and then everyone burns out and has to go take a rest. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's what you need. You need that like spurt of energy to reach something, but then understand people need to take a break afterwards. Or even when there's a crisis, understanding mm -hmm. that 
like people might need to step away from this project for a while and that's okay, or they might need to rally together. So just understand the pacing of your community and mm -hmm. making sure people aren't going too hard and checking in with people. And I just love all of these suggestions about like the co-working and leaning on community and leaning on others, just making sure you're actually asking people how they're doing and doing regular check-ins and seeing like, are people still like finding joy in this work or is mm -hmm. this becoming a real burden? Um, and then to really help with that, I find it makes it, it makes a big difference if you can structure the way people interact with your community so that it's okay for them to step away for a little while and come back and there's no shame in that. Mm -hmm. um, just make it okay for people to step in and out whenever they can. Um, that, yeah, that usually shows that you care about them and gives them permission to like take a few months out um, if it's been really rough. And I think we're seeing this now just so, yeah, with so much going on in the world, people really need to take a step back and making that okay mm -hmm. yeah. and not shaming people for that. Amazing, thank you so much, Abby. Um, and so related to that, and this is a question for Kate, um, um, it came from a community member also, and they ask in big communities, what are some of the ways that one can give every last community member a voice to make sure that they are heard and that they feel heard? I think uh, making sure that the feedback we're getting from a community is representative of the community is generally what we try to attack as a goal, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm continuing to be very interested in what I see are the outliers. Um, people who have fe felt disenfranchised from a community are like, in, in my community, we're interested in everyone involved in data intensive research. Mm -hmm. um, theoretically, that could be anyone who does biomedical research because everybody has to deal with data. And so then it becomes a question of how do I start to interact and engage with people who may not feel like they're a part of my community. Right. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about finding ways to um, solicit feedback in multiple mechanisms. And so mm -hmm. a combination of anonymous and, you know, if someone wants a response, including an email, I'm um, doing mm -hmm. informal and formal feedback mechanisms, uh, structured and unstructured. Um, and, and the truth is that it really isn't something that like I could sit down and say, this is my plan for gaining feedback because mm -hmm. really interacting with people, like it, getting feedback from them is constantly integrated in that. Yeah. Um, so every time I teach a class, I am paying attention to what my participants are saying and what mm -hmm. they continue to need. And then I fold that into sort of like the next iteration of the class I teach later. If somebody, mm -hmm. you know, seems like they're having a rough time, like dropping them an email afterwards, um, it's amazing to see like how people respond when someone sincerely asks them if they need assistance, like personally. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of a testament to the way that, you know, our academic and research culture especially in biomedical sciences is these days. Um, mm -hmm. And I think to a certain extent, by virtue of like me existing, um, you know, one of the first things I heard when I started my role, all of our scientific computing staff are middle-aged white men. And so me showing up uh, not being a middle-aged white man, um, that was in and of itself something that was very useful mm -hmm. um, to other people, you know? And the truth is that I can sort of help normalize the idea that uncertainty is a thing and that it's okay to ask questions and that you will have a response that will help you. And part of that's recognizing the limitations of your community as well, right? And so like me being able to say like, yeah, what you're struggling with right now is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And like that type of validation is incredibly important for some people to hear, um, especially if they're dealing with imposter syndrome and things like that. Um, and so I think, you know, the answer is it's a hard job, like continuing to open up and broaden the space that's available for people to step into and have mm -hmm. their voices heard. But what I can also say is that I have what I feel is a much better idea of the community than most of the other people who are relying on standard assessment mechanisms, like a survey um, that only a specific type of person will yeah. answer. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. Um, I have a follow-up question to that, um, and I think I'll, I'll throw it um, at Angela. Um, so we mentioned, Kate mentioned um, getting feedback from people, 
um, and, and being aware of some of the limitations that they have. Um, and some of these limitations are around the tools and platforms that online communities employ. Um, and this is something that we've had time and again um, in different communities. So um, question for you, Angela, how can we make um, interactions in online spaces more inclusive um, and specifically for people with disabilities and then also people from um, a non-English background? people who speak languages other than English as a first language? For sure. I think, well, obviously one of the first things to do is to, to go in knowing that you're going to make your, your space inclusive. And I, I think that's already a, a huge step is um, a lot of people, I think in communities, uh, they might not expect that their needs are like going to be met. But I think just knowing that going in um, and and, and um, planning for that from the outset is really, really important. So so keeping that in mind as you design your programming. Um, mm -hmm. I think one thing we did do in maintainer onboarding um, this past summer was um, we had some some folks who were calling in from pretty remote areas. Their internet wasn't great. Um, and I don't think they're native English speakers. And when the majority of like the cohort is in a specific place, it's really easy to cater to like the majority and not include right not include people who, um you know for your ease like you, you just ignore them and and that's really not the way to go like that is um i would caution against that so just because you know 90 percent of your group might be you know english speakers or non uh you know able-bodied like making sure that you have space for them anyway um <laughs> so it went over um but what we did was um i did check in um with those people and and um one-on-one -on -one and make sure that they had the resources and tools that they needed to succeed in the program. So um, following up and saying, hey, like I noticed that your video is off, um, I, that might be an internet connection and what can I do to provide resources and stuff um, mm -hmm. to make sure that you're able to get through this program. Um, and so I guess I heard from them and they're like, yes, like I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is this is my plan. Like I plan to read the materials after and then put the notes in later. And is that okay? Mm -hmm. And is that fine? And, and I was like, yes, that's fantastic. I'm so happy you're contributing and participating in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so working with the people that um, you're serving um, to collaboratively come up with a solution that works for them. Um, I think actually I probably should punt the disabilities one to someone who has worked more with uh, populations, but um, like I think definitely in maintainer onboarding, it, it showed me a lot about how to work one on one and how to collaborate to come up with like you know successful things that um, can make people feel welcome and and make you feel like they are a connected part of the community. So I really like what you said about designing um, your systems with these people in mind rather than building for the majority and then sort of you know putting band aid um, solutions for for this um, other people. So thank you, that's very useful, Angela. We have a very specific um, scenario here um, and I'd like Toby or Abby or Booth to speak to it. Someone asked, um, someone says, I have very limited time for other activities after school and family time. I feel like I am missing out from the fun of being involved in volunteer work and the reward that comes with it like a better resume, what does inclusion look like for people like me? I can start. Toby mm -hmm. hasn't unmuted yet. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, I think that's really valid. And I, I do think I want to talk to the project leads for a little bit. I, when you're leading a project, I think it's important to um, make room for these casual contributors. And often, something like having a cadence really helps. So people know that you're you're doing like a monthly release cycle. They can mm -hmm. come in and do a bit of QA at this time each month. And it's something they can do easily. They can drop in and out. Um, yeah, and, and creating those kinds of roles, I think that's on the onus of the project lead. It's not a busy person to try to say like, hey, I just want to try to do this a little bit. Um, so if you are a busy person, I'd say shop around for different projects and try to find something that can accommodate you. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are running a project, do make space for those kinds of things. Toby? Thanks, Abby. 
yeah, everything I'm going to say is also aimed at the leader and not at the person who wants to contribute. Uh, yeah. I guess speaking to the person who wants to contribute, that's really great. And I hope that you do. Um, from my side, I guess, I think to echo um, what's been said already about um, trying to do some things like or make space for kind of asynchronous um, communication, I guess, and a bit for sort of decision making as well. I think it can be kind of um, exclusionary to make all of the important decisions about a project or that affect a community with only the people who are able to turn up to the meeting, or, for mm -hmm. example. Um, and so being explicit open and like communicative about exactly what the process is going to be having proposals for things that are going to be decided upon published far enough in advance in a place that everyone knows where to find them um, to be able to gather all of the relevant views uh, from all of the different kind of stakeholders uh, before a decision gets made and then also communicating afterwards like what the decision actually was in the end if you see what I mean I think mm -hmm. this can be helpful i also just want to to the to the like community managers in the audience think about what the unwritten rules are of your community or your organization mm -hmm. and think interrogate why those are unwritten write them down and if you can't write any of them down or you don't feel comfortable writing some of them down, really interrogate those. Can mm. you replace those with some system that can be documented? Um, and if not, like, what does that tell you about your organization or your community? Um, and I think that then if I can speak in more specifics, having well-documented ways in which people can contribute um, including realistic estimates of the time right. and the kind of prior knowledge skills or whatever that people will need to be able to perform those tasks. I think that those things are helpful. If someone comes with limited time, they can really get a view on what it is that they're going to be able to do in the community and then make sure that that's actually true. And I know Steph's been doing some great work on, uh, contributing guides recently so I think that's a good example of that yeah I completely agree Toby um, and I will also say um, if you're in a position to and there's room for it also design ways that people can link back to um, anything that they do in your community so that they're able to add it in their CVs um, or things like that that will be really great um, so, so far, we've talked about community building, we've talked about the place of values in communities and what professional development looks like um, in community building. We've talked about self-care and community care. Uh, we've touched on um, inclusion in different ways. Um, and I think uh, we really want to talk about tech skills and soft or core skills um, a little more. Um, we have 30 minutes left to this call. Um, and as I promised, we had that um, question that was for all of us to discuss. And I think this is a really good time for us to discuss it before we then talk about tech skills and soft skills and their place in um, open communities. Um, so the question, I'm going to read it out and open it up to anyone who's um, happy to contribute. The question is, um, is the climate crisis a topic of discussion um, in our communities? Will um, have will have this type of conf will this type of conference have moved online for that reason? Or the leaders of the different communities don't think it is needed yet. Online online events are difficult to manage, but hybrid ones are probably worse. What can we do in the future to not only be inclusive but also be environmentally friendly? How much greener are virtual platforms than transport do in person events? Um, if you raise your hand, either by typing hand in chat or um, by raising your hand using um, the hand function in Zoom, I will call on you. And as we wait for people to raise hands, Toby, do you want to speak to this a bit? I do. 
um, this is a topic that's really important to me. Um, I want to address the last part of that question first. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine that virtual conference formats like this are considerably better, like greener than in-person international events in particular, if nothing else, just purely because long haul flights are so much worse than every other mode of transport in terms of like environmental impact that might not include launching people into space. I don't know, but I guess very much fewer people do that than take long haul flights. Um, and if a zoom call like this is generating that kind of like carbon output, then we have a big problem, <laughs> I guess. I think the climate change is the single biggest challenge that we face and that we all have a personal responsibility to try and do what we can to fight against that. Um, that unfortunately, I think has to include really looking at assessing the need for attendance at like international conferences and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the good things, one of the only good things about these circumstances this year with the pandemic are that it's uh, forcing everybody around the world to figure, try to figure out how to make this work, this kind of online virtual meeting or hybrid events. I think the use our community um, were yeah. running or were planning to run some kind of hybrid hub and spoke model for their conference this year. Honestly, I don't know whether that all ended up being run virtually in the end, given the circumstances, but I hope that we can figure out ways to make it work. And at this point I will make myself popular with the organizers by saying that I think they've done a really great job of running this conference virtually. Um, and I think that we've got a lot to learn still, of course, and I'm really looking forward to the feedback sessions later this week to hear about what we can do better. But I've really enjoyed the sessions I've been to. Um, and it has felt like something that was still worth kind of making the time for, even though it was a shame I couldn't see everybody in the flesh. Thank you, Toby. Uh, we got one very honest feedback from Twitter um, when we invited people to this session and someone said they had forgotten our conference was still going on and seven weeks is too long, but that they really appreciated the sessions they came to. So <laughs> there's still a lot to learn um, and this is the time to do it. Kate. I have to very much agree with Toby that the real benefit here is is recognizing that now our default will not always be we're getting together in person for all these meetings. I think we're moving to this framework of assuming that we have to have a really good reason um, and that has to be deliberate and intentional about why people would travel all the way to the other side of the world um, to do something that could potentially be done online. I think there are great benefits um, in terms of accessibility. I've been able to go to conferences that I couldn't attend. Um, because of the availability of it online. And I think it, like this question is so interesting because it has so many parts to it. Mm -hmm. um, it really helps us start to bring together like, and again, like I'm, I'm clearly very value driven lately, like what is it that we're actually trying to do um, by having a conference? Um, mm -hmm. What are the actual benefits we hope people will gain from it? I'll also say, I'm really bad at going to virtual networking sessions. like. Mm -hmm. I basically won't do it if it's voluntary, you know? Um, and it's because I find it really, really painful and emotionally exhausting to try and maintain yeah. energy. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's like, okay, so we're making it accessible so people from different areas can now attend a conference, but what is the cost of that? Like, who are we now excluding? Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, if anything, I think it's going to force us to, to break free of those assumptions, literally like the academic assumptions from the last 50 years that said, of course, we're going to get together for this conference because it's what we've done for 50 years mm -hmm. and make us think like, well, what could we do instead? And I think that's some beautiful space. Um, I, I find in my particular workplace that expectation of, of course, you can't work remotely. Like now people have to rethink that. And that's awesome. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I, again, I'm going to continue to see this challenge as an opportunity um, and perhaps eventually a way that we can start to assess some of these questions more thoroughly. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, and I think Adam has a hand. Yes, thank you. I, I've uh, thought about the, the idea of, you know, having online conferences and then uh, also having smaller groups of meetings with people who are closer to each other, but these long distance ones doing online. And the, the main point that I wanted to bring up was, I think we've all uh, come into a situation where we didn't even know that there was a like-minded person who was working in the same organization or something. Actually, I mean, in the same town or in the same building or something. And so uh, taking that opportunity to focus on getting those people who are in close proximity together, I think is a wonderful benefit. I agree. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, Steph, um, use R has been mentioned severally. Um, I wonder if you'd mind sharing it briefly, how it ran, um, how it was structured um, for the benefit of people who weren't there. Um, but, it, you know, in case there are things we can learn from that setup as well. I'm wondering, Angela, were you involved at all in any of the organization or any of the sessions? Because I was a listener for a couple of sessions and <laughs> that was it. Um, one thing I did really appreciate was it gave this opportunity for people to, you know, there were some live keynote talks that were recorded, but there was also an opportunity for people to record um, like what would be posters, but they became like a 15 minute talk or something. And they were pre-recorded and you could watch those at any time. Yeah. Um, one of the things I particularly appreciated, and again, I think this is where remote brought something to the fore that wouldn't have been done before. Um, mm -hmm. There is this really strong Latin American community of R users. And they put together this incredible presentation. And part of it was led by Laura Asion and a couple of other people um, where they put together like two minutes on all of these different organizations that their community participates in and wanted to promote. Um, and each of them did a presentation. So they had the script ready, but it was like, this person spoke for two minutes, this person spoke for two minutes, but it was recorded. And so everyone could have, could be recognized as contributing. And it's like, there's their face and their everything. It would, that was brilliant. Um, mm. So I feel like that was an opportunity that wouldn't have come about because maybe one of those people would have been able to present in person. Angela, I don't know if you would know anything else about any of the stuff. Yeah, I think one other thing to say about Uzar is that they were actually able to take the tutorials for Uzar and actually share them across the world. So um, mm -hmm. each R Ladies group, which is a group that is for women and gender minorities using R, um, was able to like around the world, like in Latin America, in Europe, in Africa, and you know, in, in other places was able to host a tutorial. So that's just, I think it's just a degree of access that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Um, so, so I thought that was a really cool way to, to do that tutorial system. And, and um, yes, and thank you. Oh yeah, Paula said that she was, she was there for the video. Thank you so much for your work, Paula. Um, yeah, I guess like on the climate question, I think like, I feel like the, you know, climate is a huge issue. And um, I think there's a sliding scale on how much people mm -hmm. take it into account when planning various things. And, and you'll see this in a lot of places. Some people don't care at all. And some people are like, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to conferences because they're too far away or, you know, but I think like that combined with like a lot of other reasons to do online conferences is a huge reason why we should, we should think about that. So um, mm -hmm. I, I do know people who won't go to conferences if it involves like a, a flight, you know, like a, a certain distance. Um, I've been trying to, for me, I was really excited that Carpentry Con was in Madison because that was like a, a train ride, which was very eco-friendly um, from, from where I was in Chicago. But um, if it's in South Africa, I probably wouldn't go. So, um, although I would love to see South Africa, but, you know, climate wise, like that's, that's a huge impact. So um, I think thinking through um, in, the environmental impact as well as sort of all the other factors can, can yeah. really help us sort of think about the future of conferences. Absolutely. Um, I've seen some people, some organizations also do carbon offsetting, which is 
like for every couple of miles that you fly, you donate and plant trees. That's one thing that people also do. Um, Toby, I want you to um, voice the um, other concerns around in-person conferences and how exclusive they end up being um, that you put in chat and then we will move on to the next agenda item. Thanks, Sarah. I think this is the most important thing I was supposed to say and I forgot to say it. So thanks for giving me the space, I guess. Um, I think that there are plenty of things we need to like worry about and think about with making virtual or hybrid events accessible to everybody. Um, but whenever we talk about this, it's really important not to consider like the standard in-person event format as the perfect thing. And we're trying to reproduce that because they're imperfect in loads of ways. And specifically, I think from an accessibility and a like inclusivity perspective, there are plenty of international events that are completely impossible for people to get to for visa reasons because they've got care commitments that mean that they can't be away from home for that long um, or because they can't afford it because it's a really expensive plane fare followed by a really expensive registration fee and really expensive accommodation costs um, and all of those things you don't need to worry about if you need to connect up to a virtual event. Um, and so I, in general, I, I want to encourage people to look at this as like an opportunity rather than a threat. Mm. It's a shame that you don't get to meet up with all your cool friends from around the world, like three times a year. Yeah, that is a pity, but there are plenty of really great things that we can make happen if we can nail these, um, these like alternative uh, meeting formats. Thank you, Toby. Um, so we have to move on in the interest of time, but this has been very informative. I also want to say that there's a lot of really interesting um, links in, in the chat. So if anyone can volunteer to copy them over to a link section in the etherpad so we don't lose them, that will be really great. Um, so we got quite a number of questions from community members about tech skills and soft or core skills. Um, and their place in open communities. And I'm going to read one question, which I think sort of covers a lot of the others. And then um, I will invite Steph and Kate to speak on this. Um, so the question goes, um, is community work a support for technical work or part and parcel of technical work? I ask because in many tech conferences, community talks are in a separate track from technical talks and attendees have to choose one or the other. Also, community leaders are not involved in tech decisions, even though community is the main reason for technical and non-technical work. Is this good practice? Can it be better? Uh, yes, to all of that stuff. Let me see. So I feel like, um, yes, I have recognized in the past and previous roles. And in fact, yes, I was told at one point, you know, don't ever during your work day, work on organizing this seminar series that you do. Um, I'm like, okay, so I'll take a 90% time job and <laughs> I had to like stop yeah, I had to get paid less in order to keep doing my community building work. Um, with this uh, legitimization of community engagement as a career, I feel like some of that might be equalizing. There's probably a long way to go. Um, there are certainly skills that maybe people are starting to appreciate more that play a critical role in community building work, interpersonal skills like having empathy and active listening and you know as I said like my my interpersonal approach to community management is it's not necessarily sustainable but I feel like it's one of the keys to being successful because when someone says something I feel like I understand what they're saying um, and that sounds odd but like I feel like I do that more, <laughs> more than some other people mm, yeah it's a hard road but maybe 
um, one of the things people do again is like find your like-minded people and people who totally get what you're doing and appreciate what you're doing because all of a sudden you have all this community around you where they're valuing the skills that you that you do have. I don't have anything wise to say. That was wise. I mean, more you. wise. <laughs> okay, um, Kate, you you recently ran a workshop um, here for Carpentry Con. Um, yeah, so I'd love to hear from you too. Um, this piggybacks pretty closely on what I talked about earlier about things always doing double duty. Um, mm -hmm. And the double duty for a community is often that they're getting some sort of professional development about it that is largely absent in the rest of their work. Um, I mean, I think Steph has already done a great job talking about how problematic sort of a, the current culture is in a lot of places around soft skills development. Mm -hmm. And so I think starting to understand and map um, what a soft skill or some area of professional development or interpersonal skills, how that maps onto the rest of the work you do. Um, and even though it's kind of gross to talk about it relating to productivity, you know, like trying to bridge that gap between the things that you want to do and things that, you know, a corporate or a leadership type role will see as appealing. Um, that can be a compelling argument. That being said, like I'm already seeing that some of these transitions are occurring. I was mm -hmm. just talking to a colleague um, yesterday who is director level and was talking about looking for a new senior Python programmer. And the idea was that, that their particular group was willing to compromise on how advanced someone's like documented Python skills were if they were very proficient in mentorship. Mm -hmm. And being able to say that that was the priority that they were willing to place on the role to me seemed really significant, that it wasn't like we want an expert Python programmer and if they're a mentor, then that'll also be great. And I think people are starting to realize that the deliberate cultivation of some of these skills is exactly what most people have to do. You know, a, a lot of people assume that like you're never going to be able to move up in leadership unless you're a natural born leader, but that's actually not the case. A lot of us have to be very deliberate in seeking that out. Um, and then starting to recognize that, you know, a reasonable manager acknowledges that employees deserve a certain portion of professional development time. There is time in your weekly schedule or your monthly schedule to pursue some of those opportunities. And I think, you know, Carpentry Con at Home has been an awesome example of ways that you can start to actually get those needs met without also having to go to your boss and ask for money to attend something, which is great. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kate. I, I absolutely love that. Um, one other thing I've seen work really well is um, conference organizers or people who have the authority to make decisions about who speaks in what track. Um, um, actively reaching out to people who are considered tech leaders, for example, and inviting them to speak about, um, you know, soft and core skills, um, and then also leaving space for technical talks to people who um, are probably considered more junior or, you know, like instead of having technical leaders constantly share about, you know, like give talks about tech, um, sort of swapping those roles around um, is, is one other way that can help. Um, Abby, do you have, um, do you want to add to this? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I was going to ask if I could jump in. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I do want to say, yeah, I think what, um, I think what Kate just put in the chat a couple, yeah, it's, it, it is a false dichotomy. The soft skills are different from technical skills. And often a newcomer to your project needs technical mentorship, right? Like t community work should be part of everyone in your project. Um, I think sometimes when you name someone community manager, then mm -hmm. they're like, oh, that person's going to do all the community work. I will just focus on this. And, and that leads to a project that's not growing as well as it could be because you don't have as many people onboarding others or mentoring others or, or inviting others. I think it should be everyone's job to do community and not just one person. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, I want to invite a question or two from um, everyone. So in case you have a question and you want to voice it, um, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Kari has a hand. Yes, thank you all so much for the session. My, my question is at the, at the beginning of the session, Sarah gave a wonderful 
sort of definition for a community. And I was wondering if each of the panelists could share what their definition of community is to see if, if everyone says the same thing <laughs> or just what the different perspectives are. Yeah. Oof, way to make us sweat, Kari. Um, <laughs> who wants to go first? I'm willing to say something about that because um, speaking of Toby saying, you know, you have to think about these things, these unwritten things and write them down. It's like, oh, darn. Um, <laughs> So I specifically in this contributing guide, we just wrote like bold faced a phrase I had just written, which is, you know, our Eye community uh, includes people who self-identify as being as part of the Arvind Sai community. That's different from our definition of um, who is invited to join our Slack group because our Slack is semi-open. It's not just, it used to be Googleable, um, not anymore. Um, did I just freeze? No, we good? Uh, Anyway, so yes, people who self-identify, but there might be other subsets of things that's not accessible to everyone, but it's like, if you feel like you're part of the community, you are, and that might involve, you know, you use one of our packages and you tell us how it is that you used it so someone else can know about this example. Like that's a great contribution and it might take you 30 minutes, but it's an incredibly valuable contribution. Thank you, Steph. Uh, Kate has a hand. Yeah, I kind of mentioned earlier that my community is like basically everyone in the research community. If they're dealing with data, then I care about having them. And it's, I think it's interesting because almost implicitly uh, says that people who do not identify as part of my community are still in it, right? And even people who may vociferously state they are not a part of it, I still feel like I need to represent Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in general, maybe my idea of community is the vision of what I feel like, you know, biomedical researchers should be able to do um, mm -hmm. with data and with computation. Um, and in aiming for that vision, I'm trying to support the entire community. But now I'm, I'm really starting to think about like, what does it mean to represent the community versus represent that vision? Um, mm -hmm. And how disingenuous is it of me? to aim for an ideal rather than um, sort of target people where they are. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm still not going to start to teach anything that's like super proprietary because I can't go there. I will always stay open source. But what does that mean in terms of the computational community that needs to have support for non-open source solutions? I don't know that I have a, a good answer to that right now. Um, I do know that, you know, it's, it's not a small thing to convince people that, you know, training which everybody at my workplace agrees is a really important thing is actually synonymous with community building mm -hmm. and linking those together has been a really, really powerful approach for us. Amazing. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'm trying to see if there are other hands or if we can continue to answer Carrie's question. Does anyone else have? Christina has a hand. Yeah, I have a, a quick question for the group. Um, mm -hmm. What for the panelists is, so the first statement of my question, what is rewarding about being a community manager? But specifically, what about you do you find rewarding in being a community manager? Um, either you're what you, what you value as a person or your professional interests or that kind of thing. So basically, why should you become a community manager? Go. I guess I can start. You stealthily learn a lot um, that you wouldn't have otherwise learned from being mm -hmm. a community manager. Like you're forced into learning things that might be uncomfortable for you to learn but then when you learn them, you're so grateful for having gone through that. So I think that's sort of vague, but I just, I, I can't count like the number of times that I was like, oh, I, I don't really know very much about yeah. this. Then I had to learn it and then I learned it. And, and that was like, I, I just love to sort of stumble across like that capacity of myself and um, mm -hmm. seeing that happen to other people too. That's, that's really exciting too. So 
I completely agree, Angela. This is one of those roles um, that, you know, is defined as it is your job to empower others, um, but it also requires working, like being where the people are all of the time. And so more often than not, you set out to empower people and end up learning so much. <laughs> and so it, it just is a very lovely cycle to be caught up in. Um, Abby has a hand. Yeah, I think, um, I know I don't often self-identify as a community manager, but it's definitely like what I've been doing or what I've been teaching people how to do. Um, but for me, it was like, like seeing this real need in scientific software. Like a lot of scientific software was just really difficult to contribute to. Um, and I think that was because of how it was being run and they didn't have nice onboarding. They didn't have um, a lot of things a community manager would do or they didn't have like nice ways to get involved. So that's been really rewarding just seeing like science move forward because mm -hmm. of better community management and just seeing, yeah, how that, just this role that doesn't seem like on the surface that it's needed for science, but it definitely is. It just supercharges so much work. Um, so yeah, that's what's been most rewarding for me. Thanks for sharing, Avi. Uh, we have time for one more person to share before we have to do closing remarks. Okay. Right. So let's do closing remarks. Um, so we um, are at the end, um, close to the end of Carpentry Con at Home. It's been seven weeks of amazing sessions of different kinds. Um, and, you know, community members from around the world have participated. Um, and so a question for us all is um, how can we continue to um, build inclusive computational communities and leaders beyond Carpentry Con at home? Um, and we can start with you, Steph. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I feel like I'm doing way too many plugs for this contributing guide, but like I said, we just released it yesterday. <laughs> the fact is my motivation for developing it in the first place was that people would contact me and say, I'd like to get involved in our open sci. And they're like, okay. <laughs> um, and it was a challenge and very like low throughput one-on-one -on -one, trying to figure out what did that mean to them and what mm -hmm. might they contribute that would give them what they want, but also meet our needs at the same time. And trying to figure this stuff out one-on-one -on -one is totally not sustainable. And it's also not accessible because it's like, someone needs to feel comfortable reaching out to someone in the organization. Yeah. And sometimes we're perceived as an organization as like, ooh, it's an in-club of really advanced developers, which is not necessarily true. So we designed the guide, like really trying to, I was trying to get in the heads of people who might want to contribute and, and think, um, so there's a chapter, you know, what brings you here? Mm -hmm. And a bunch of I want to statements like, um, I want to raise my profile in the open science R community. And so under that, there are a couple of actions like, hey, maybe you want to uh, review a package because then there's an open thread of your participation here. Um, or maybe you want to share a use case for how you have used the software. And then we do a lot to promote it. We've got 30,000 followers on Twitter here. Let, let us help you raise your profile by you mm. contributing something to us. So there's that chapter. And then there's a chapter um, that brings together all of our resources for the first time. So the, yes, they're linked on our website, but we have stuff everywhere. It's like intentionally saying, here's this thing. Here's our philosophy of it. Here's how you can contribute. And so when you say, I wanna do this, and you click on this action, it takes you to the section that says, here's the, how you can do it. So now it's not, nobody needs to know somebody. It's a thing out there online for free um, that anyone can have a look at and then hopefully not feel so sheepish about um, participating in. I also mm -hmm. feel like, I mean, yeah, transparency for the win. Um, but also I'm hoping that other communities might be able to use parts of this as a blueprint for how they might approach doing it for their communities. So that's my take. That's fantastic, um, especially the bit about, you know, communities being able to look at this and see how it can translate to their communities, because as Abby said, um, you don't always have to start from scratch, find what's out there, and then build on it, um, you know, in a way that makes sense for your community. Thank you so much, Steph. Um, Angela Lee. 
Yes, I think one thing, if you're like me, you probably went to like one or two sessions, took like a gazillion notes and then put the notes in like a folder and then like won't look at them ever again. Mm. I would consider, uh, say to yourself, like what's one thing that I will take away from the sessions that I attended and yeah. how will I use that to build my community around me? Just like a single thing, like, you know, not like you don't have to go through like the two pages of notes that you took on like that one session, like three weeks ago, but um, just just ponder to yourself, like, how am I going to change this into action? How am I going to take what I've learned through these mm. sessions and, and really use it to move something forward? And it can just be like one nugget. It doesn't have to be like, I want to do this and this and this and this. It's just like that one thing. Um, so that is my question to you. What are you going to take from Carpentry Con to think about uh, moving forward? Amazing. And I love that it builds on your earlier suggestion to do retrospectives time and again to audit where you are and where you were before and how things have changed. So that's really great. Thank you, Angela. Um, Abby. Yeah, I think a lot of the skills needed for building this community. Um, you learn this through mentorship. I think mentorship is so important. And, and it might not be that you have like an actual person who's calling themselves your mentor. This could be mm -hmm. peer mentorship. Um, just you need people around you supporting you doing this. And I think it's really important that you, um, yeah, that you, you put yourself in a community where you're learning how to do this and learning how to lead a community and build something really inclusive um, and like learning how to be a leader. And yeah, I probably should have thought longer about this question since it's like the final <laughs> closing. <laughs> But I think by, by getting that mentorship, but then also mentoring others so that they know how to do that, I think that's how we'll really change what the landscape looks like if you're actually intentionally helping others do the same. Mm -hmm. um, so please think about someone you can mentor. <laughs> That's really great, Abby. Um, I think we've been in a call. I remember Christina was there. And um, in that call, we were talking about how to help people see themselves as the mentors they already are. Um, and peer mentorship is such an invaluable thing to do. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Kate. I have been thinking a lot lately about how we assess success in the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the best things we can do for ourselves as we're trying to figure out how to grow a community is to figure out how you'll tell that the community is healthy. Um, are you looking for number of people um, enrolling in a newsletter or participating in a Slack channel or mm -hmm. something like that? Are you like looking for levels of engagement um, or are you looking for another specific type of interaction that'll help you understand it? Um, I've been trying to think more lately about community leadership as recognizing um, like two things that are kind of uncomfortable for me to do, but that are actually most of my job and that's repeating myself. Mm -hmm. um, and also asking for help, often mm -hmm. repeating asks for help. And both of those are the ways that you start to change the culture to fit the type of community that you would like to see or to sustain that culture, mm -hmm. um, as well as find people to help you sustain it. And so I think, <laughs> Toby, I'm laughing at your chat comment. Um, and so I think the punchline is that figure out what you're trying to succeed in and then keep repeating those and keep asking mm -hmm. for help for those. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how we're going to figure out, you know, sort of like the place that we want to go um, and, and avoid trying to start a whole bunch of new stuff. A lot of community development is telling people that things exist and that they mm -hmm. can be helped by them. And mm -hmm. it's not easy and it's not always fun, um, but consistent messaging is very important. Yeah. I really love that, um, and especially because asking for help um, also has an element of transparency to it, but also vulnerability, which helps us to earn trust with the communities that we work with. And <laughs> that is hard, but it is important to cultivate. So thank you, Kate. Um, and Toby. I'll keep this brief. Um, this is a question with a lot of different elements to it and I've chosen to focus in a cowardly fashion on one um, which is the growing part so mm -hmm. like what I've observed is that once your community grows beyond a certain size um, the community manager or the leader 
if there is only one or even if there isn't can't be involved in every discussion and every decision and every project and so you need to make sure that you trust your community members to do that stuff without you you need yep. to make sure that they've been empowered to do that stuff without you mm -hmm. and this is what I want to say to all of you who haven't reached that stage yet even if you haven't reached that stage yet think about what you can be doing now to make mm -hmm. sure that when that happens you're not the bottleneck that you've designed things from the ground up so that everything has to go through you um so for example like avoid building processes where like all everyone's looking at you the entire time to make the decision about about what happens make it clear to people how and that they are allowed to make those decisions then the other thing um i want to mention is the places where i've got into trouble before have been where i've spent like months just running from one thing to another kind of mm -hmm. led by a seemingly permanent sense of urgency um, to do the things they need doing right now block time in your calendar to take a step back and take that like strategic view on where you're trying to get to in the end because I have personally had the experience that I found that I've kind of wandered off that track because I was chasing after the thing that I needed to I felt like I needed to chase after right then mm -hmm. thank you Toby so build resources, empower people, and get out of the way. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you all so much for sharing um, your ideas and suggestions, experiences. Um, this has been really great. It's time to go. Um, so Jason, closing remarks, and we go. <laughs> sure. I, it was a fantastic session. Uh, thank you for moderating, and thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, last things to think about. Uh, number one, um, this is actually going to happen again. <laughs> so thank you to those who are going to show up a second time tomorrow. Um, you can check the Etherpad for the link. But some of you might have had questions, or even tonight you'll have dreams um, that will pose, you know, new new questions that you want to bring back to our panelists. And maybe even more important, I think, after hearing the conversation, you might recommend this to other people who didn't uh, think about attending or make sure. So I would pass that along because it was really uh, a tremendous number of some total years of knowledge uh, shared here. So I, I really appreciated that. Um, the other thing is that there will be a survey uh, that you will um, be able to take at some point. Uh, so if you do see a Carpentry Con survey or a question about this particular session in your inbox, uh, we'd like to collect that. Um, so that's all that I had. I don't know if there's anything else, uh, Sarah. Other than that, we thank everybody for attending. Uh, I'll, I'll close the meeting in about 30 seconds. I can stop the recording now.